to 15, um, the parables. So um, yeah. So yeah. Any other any other responses? Message of the kingdom to the Pharisees. Are this the sir? Can I share one? Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. The part is here. Jesus is uh, the heart of God. The concern and the love He has for the lost, His mm. concern, and how much uh, He is taking so much care in getting mm. back in what one lost sheep, just mm. uh, leaving behind the ninety. We see the heart of God and His love. Yeah. Right, right. Yes, he, he did uh, come to share about the um, you know uh, the reason for his coming, the objective of his message, and yes, he was directing the you know what he was sharing to the Pharisees and scribes, and um, and specifically we see that the Pharisees were actually complaining, saying that this man, this Jesus, he receives sinners, he eats with them, he's spending time with them, he's mingling with them, then. Verse 3 says, so he spoke this parable to them. So he spoke this parable to them. Okay, so the lost sheep, lost sheep, lost coin, and uh, finally the prodigal son or the lost son, right? So um, we read uh, the lost, we read about the lost sheep. So um, in all these parables, you see there's something that is lost. Okay, so in the first uh, parable, there is the lost sheep. Um, and there is someone who is going in search of the lost sheep. Okay, something that is lost. There were 100. One is lost. And uh, this shepherd goes in search of the lost sheep. Okay. Then in, in, uh, in the parable of the lost coin, okay, if you can quickly read through that, um, the woman has 10 silver coins. And if she, if she uses one coin, and she lights a lamp, sweeps the house, searches until she finds it, and then she calls her friends and neighbors, saying, "You know, rejoice with me! I have found the piece which I had lost." Okay, so there's somebody who's going after the, the lost. Okay, then we also see that there is much rejoicing when that lost have been found. Okay, so the Lord is uh, the reason for the Lord to share this parable is is He's talking about the Father's heart. You know, so you guys are saying that uh, you know I'm spending time with these people who are sinners, and uh, you know I'm I'm eating with them, I'm uh, mingling with them, and um, uh, I'm spending time with them. But this is what heaven is about, and this is what the Father's heart is about. That the Father goes in search, right? So there is this searching. Uh, and finding that which is lost. Okay, now the lost are priority for the Father. Like the lost are priority for God the Father, and uh, and His heart is to find them, to bring them back. And there is a lot of rejoicing when the lost are found. Okay, so He's He's revealing to them, this is what uh, you know heaven's priority is. This is what. The father's heart is about, okay. and yeah, like you said, uh, Anita, uh, Lord's concern for his lost children, his heart is compassionate. Yes, longs to be with them, right? So he is revealing the father's heart, you know, saying he's, he's bringing back the priority, he's realigning, you know, adjusting the priority, and 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 why are we doing this? You know, the Pharisees and scribes, you know, you teach us of the law, you're teaching what is in the law, all the do's and don'ts and everything. You know, why are you doing this? Right. Uh, the reason why the bigger picture is this: that the father is concerned for the lost. You know, so he's just bringing that, uh, and 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 he, he does that in, in these parables. Okay, let's look at the other parable, the parable of the lost son. Okay, so uh, a certain man had two sons. So I'm just paraphrasing that. Okay, the younger says, uh, "Give me my portion of goods, my inheritance, and uh, whatever falls to me." So he, you know, he takes it goes on a journey, squanders it, okay? spends everything. And there is a severe famine in the land. And uh, he, he has spent all his, uh, you know, uh, his father's hard-earned money and he's spent it. And he uh, 
you know, um, meets with the citizen of that country, and then he feeds the swine, and uh, and he is, you know, he's he's literally is looking at the, the the food that the swine are eating, the pigs are eating, and he's saying, you know, given a chance, I'll I'll fill it, you know, I given a chance, I'll just eat this, okay, and uh, and several things we learn there, you know, he's uh, of course. Uh, uh, you know the Jewish person and these feeding swine and and all that we, you know, all those extra details are there. But the but the thing is that you know he uh, he came to himself, meaning he you know suddenly there's reason, there's light in his thinking. You know it's, he came to himself and he said, and he was thinking about his father's house. They were hired servants in my father's house. They have bread enough and to spare. So his need has really driven him to uh, come to that. You know, he hit rock bottom, and um, and then he came comes to himself. He there's a realization that in my father's house, the servants who serve there, they have enough bread to eat. They have enough to eat and to spare. So he's saying, I will go back. To my father. Okay, uh, I will arise and go back to my father. That's verse eighteen, right? And I will say to him. So he's rehearsing his script. He's rehearsing his lines. You know, he's saying, "I will arise," and he's picturing. You know, the father will be there. I will arise. I will go to the father, and this is what I'm going to tell him. And he's and he's going through the lines. Right? He's saying, "Father, I have sinned against heaven." No, 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 no. I, I have to say it with, you know, I, with a lot more remorse. You know, I've sinned against heaven and before you. And probably he was doing all that. And he's saying, "You know, I will arise and go to my father, and will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you." I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me one like your, uh, make me like one of your hired servants. And, um, you know, so they say, this is what, this is the line. I'm going to say, you know, I've, I've missed it I'm against heaven and against you. I have sinned and I'm not worthy to be called your son. Therefore, make me like your servant. I'm sure my father will. You know, respond well to that. Um, you know, I I know I messed up. I have sinned. It's a it's a great thing, but this this should work. So much so, he's so convinced that he says, you know, uh, verse twenty, and he arose and came to his father. He said, okay, this will work. Uh, you know, this should work. These lines should work, and and the fact that you know uh, that I'm coming back and I'm, I'm I can be a servant in his house. This should really really work. And then we see the response, right? We see the response of the father, verse 20. It's, uh, it's really an amazing, amazing verse. And he arose and came to his father. But while he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. OK, so. The response of the father to a person who has said, who came to himself when he repented and said, I'm going back to the father. I'm going back to my father's house. Okay, and see the response of the father while he was still afar off, a great way off, it says. Okay, uh, but he was still a great way off. Was, there was still some distance. He hadn't reached. He hadn't, um, you know, uh, he hadn't sh shared those lines yet. I'm unworthy to be called your son. Uh, he hadn't had the opportunity to share those lines yet, to speak those lines. He was still a distance off. The father runs. The father has compassion. The father runs towards the son and for uh, and 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 hugs him embraces him and kisses him and then the son is saying father you know i have sinned against heaven in your sight i'm no longer worthy to be called your son but the father said to his servants bring out the best robe put it on him put a ring on his finger the sandals on his feet bring the fatted calf here kill it and let us eat and be merry for this, my son was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found, and they began to be merry. You know, see the father's reaction, father's heart, the father's response to the confession, uh, of, you know, say of sin. And he's saying, you know, this is, you know, bring 
the robe. Bring the best robe. Not just any robe. Bring the best robe. Put it on him. Put the ring back on his finger. The ring representing, you know, the signet ring, the authority and everything. You know, put it on him. And, uh, well, we're not going to be mourning and we're not going to be uh, sitting in a corner and uh, we're not going to be you know, reasoning out uh, who did wrong, what, when, where. It's going to be a rejoicing time here. And we see that in each of those you know, parables, lost sheep, lost coin, that there was great rejoicing, great rejoicing, joy in the presence of the angels over one sinner who repents. Um, that is what we see. And then you know, there's more joy in heaven over one rather than the 99 who do not need repentance. Right? And here we see the father's heart. The father running, the father's uh, uh, doing something which is so, so radical. Okay, and he says, for this my son was dead and he's alive, he was lost and he's found. We should make merry. There should be rejoicing, right? So, um, so that's, that's, you know, end of scene one, <laughs> okay? Act one, the end. And then act two is about the elder son. So the elder son, he was in the field, he's been working. So he comes, he hears, the music, he hears, you know, oh, he sees the dancing, and then he smells the food, obviously, and he's and he, he's asking the servants, you know, um, and they said to him, the brother has come, uh, sorry, your brother has come, younger brother, and the father has received him, and uh, it's safe and sound, the father has killed the fatted calf, and, uh, you know, there's rejoicing, and you see the disconnect, right? The elder brother is angry. The elder brother is angry and he wouldn't go in. He's like, I, I don't want to join in this rejoicing. I don't want to have any part in this thing that's happening there. Why? He says, you know, I have been serving you. I have not transgressed your commandments. I have been serving, I've never transgressed. And yet you never gave me a goat that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this son of yours who devoured your livelihood with harlots, he has come back and you killed the fatted calf for him. So I'm offended, I'm angry at this wastage and at, you know, at your reaction to this person who has wasted away everything and he's come back and you want to you know, honor and rejoice and have this feast in his honor. I'm offended. I have kept everything. I've, I've never uh, disobeyed your commandments. And you never gave me this. And see the father's response again. Father says, son, you are always with me. And all that I have is yours. Right? You are always with me. And all that I have is yours. All that, that is your position. All that I have is yours. And it was right that we should make merry because he was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So, um, you know, two responses we see here and, and the father uh, saying that this is how we should respond to the lost coming back. This is how, you know, he was lost, he was dead, he's alive. He was lost, he was found. And therefore we should make merry. So we, we learn a lot of things. So. Um, so I, I, we, we, we're not really, you know, we don't see the response um, of the Pharisees here to this, but I'm sure it, it made a dent, right, so, uh, in their understanding. Um, so they, so he was actually sharing, this is the Father's heart. This is what happens in heaven. There's rejoicing. This is the Father's heart. And, and you see the lost. And this is what I came. I came to seek and to save the lost. Right. So he was um, really sharing that, and he did so with these parables. Okay. Luke chapter fifteen also has several other parables um, of the unjust steward, and then the parable, of the law, the prophets the, about the kingdom of God, and so on. So, um, so we see several other parables there. Right. So, but uh, the thing is, this you know, is beautifully he just taught them. Uh, and in, in very, a very important lesson 
about uh, perspective, right? about what our perspective should be towards those who are lost. And, um, and, and heaven's perspective, the Father's heart um, towards sinners and so on. Yes, Charles, you have a question? No, I didn't have a question. I forgot to throw on my hand. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Okay, no worries, no worries, no problem. Okay, so we see this, and uh, it's amazing, right? Uh, and um, especially verse 20, it's amazing because uh, in the Jewish culture, it was considered undignified for a person of stature to run, you know, to run after. To, to hurry and run and do something and because there was always others who would run and carry out uh, you know the the command right um, so there were servants there but the father ran talking about you know the radical love uh, that the father has talks about grace right yeah I don't deserve it the son says I don't deserve it and it was true you know he was right saying I don't deserve it I don't deserve to be uh, you know called a son and I will be a servant. So that was the the you know the repentant person saying that I don't want that position. You know, uh, and and the repentant heart saying I don't want that position. I don't deserve that position. But God saying you know, yeah, I know you don't deserve it, but I'm going to give it to you anyway. And I'm going to you know I'm going to clothe you with the best robe. I'm going to restore that position and even more. And we're going we're not going to do it in a you know, with a long face, we're not going to do it in a very religious manner. But we're going to be, we're going to be singing and dancing now, right? And and all those things are going to be broken down. All those religious walls, everything, um, they're going to be broken now, right? And uh, and this, the the nature of grace, right? Which, um, um, yeah, but wasn't the father a prodigal father too? I don't, I don't understand that, Charles. Um, probably you could just explain from the father. I, I am, I am, I, I am looking at the word prodigal son. Yeah. Though the, it is lost, eh? mm -hmm. but also his love wasn't he also wistful, like he was. When we look at the elder son, mm -hmm. the way he was complaining, the man was doing a lot of things on the other guy. Mm. Wasn't he also wistful? I'm j just thinking humanly. Yes. Yeah, prodigal means, you know, like extravagant and lavishing and so on. Uh, but I don't know whether the prodigal is used in a negative manner. So I wonder whether they can use it. But yes, you know, the, the, the kind of grace, the kind of uh, thing that he had for the son is, was bordering on that. Yes. Uh, so... I don't know if we can use that word prodigal really, uh, because we don't use it in our, I'm not really familiar, but prodigal does mean that it's extravagant and, uh, you know, uh, lavish and uh, lavish scale. Um, but I don't know in what sense, you know, whether it means uh, a negative thing, you know, then we, I, I suppose we can't use it. We can use a, um, a word that describes it in a very positive manner because of his love and, and so on. Um, yeah, but I get your point. Yeah, it was, it was here also, it was like, you know, kind of reckless and lavishing. Yeah. Right. So, uh, about the grace of God and so for a religious mind, you know, even for, um, the salvation by grace, um, by grace through faith, uh, was something which was, um, uh, but that was, you know, uh, uh, that was really, um, uh, not sitting well with the Jewish mindset, but the Lord came to reveal that. And even in Paul's writings, you know, in, in Romans, uh, when you read, you you see um, the Paul just writing down and and telling them about the grace of God, telling them about uh, yes, uh, this was uh, the Son, uh, uh, you know, uh, how grace came through the through the sun and so on. So um, truth and grace, right? <laughs> Excuse me. So, um, so, the, so very powerfully, uh, the Lord conveyed through these parables. 
Okay, so, so he used metaphors, he used hyperboles, and then he used parables. And uh, I'm sure people never forgot these parables, forgot the, the deeper truth behind those parables. Of course, you remember the stories, but you remember also what those stories were conveying, right? So, um, so we see that. Okay, and uh, we see several other parables on uh, on some of the other themes that the Lord taught on. Okay, forgiveness, generosity, humility, on the kingdom, on judgment, on the law, and so on. So those are uh, listed in uh, in page eighteen in that table there. Okay, um, so we have about nine themes and uh, the parables that were uh, that the Lord taught. So I, I, I uh, so what we can do is go through these parables this week. Okay, you can, um, you know, go through these parables, read through them, and uh, next Monday when we meet, we'll we can discuss this. Right, we'll um, have a discussion on these parables. Right. Okay. So um, so any other. Um, any other thoughts, anything that you see in these parables that we saw just now um, that you'd like to share? Um, okay, I think Beth has shared about um, uh, how the gospel came to the tribal hills where you live. Okay, so Beth, if you can put it on the, see, the chat won't be uh, there, you know, once we finish the class, the chat will just, uh, you know, won't be accessible. So if you can put it in the stream where you, the link is put you know, for the class, then that will be, um, that will be useful. So others can read it uh, whenever they want to, right? Thank you for sharing that. Um, okay. Right. Okay. So let's um, let's look at um, um, so this week. You know, um, please. Uh, uh, in addition to this research about how the gospel came to your city, your town, you can also um, read through all the parables that are listed here. These nine categories, and then we'll we'll talk about that. Okay. Um, okay. Okay. Let's look at chapter seven. The teacher in the early church. Okay. The teacher in the early church. So we see that in the early church, the best place to go to is the book of Acts. So uh, we see several references in the book of Acts about how there was teaching. Okay, So there was preaching and there was teaching as well. So Acts chapter 5 and verse 42. So maybe you can just open the, your uh, Bible and uh, we'll just quickly go through a few verses. And daily in the temple and in every house, they did not cease teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. So this was the content of their teaching. They were teaching and they did not cease. They did not stop teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. Okay, Jesus as the Messiah uh, who had come. Okay, so then Acts chapter 13 and verse 1. Um, now in the church that was at Antioch, there were certain prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, uh, Lucius, uh, Manan, Herod, the Tetrarch, and Saul. So these people are listed, and uh, they say that uh, uh, it, it is recorded that at Antioch, the church at Antioch, there were prophets and there were teachers. So, um, so these people were recognized as teachers who would teach uh, about Christ, teach the, the truth of Scripture, right? Um, chapter 15 and verse 35. Paul and Barnabas also remained in Antioch, teaching and preaching the word of the Lord with many others also. So Barnabas, uh, uh, along with Paul, staying in Antioch, teaching and preaching um, the word of the Lord with many others as well. Right? Uh, then we go to 18 and verse, um, verse 1 or verse 11. Right? Uh, chapter 18 and verse 11. Um, so this is uh, in the church uh, at Corinth. So Paul goes to Corinth. This is during his second missionary journey. He goes there and he uh, he continued, says there, and he continued there a year and six months teaching the word of God among them. Okay, so uh, in Corinth, church established, he's teaching the word of God. And, um, and obviously there was, uh, you know, 
there was teaching, there was demonstration of the power, because when we study about the church in Corinth, we see that, uh, you know, um, in the epistles that he wrote to them to set right a whole lot of things in the church, right? He, to, to set right uh, the use of the gifts, the right way to use the gifts, the right way to consider the gifts, the right way to consider the, the servants of God, um, and so on, right? So uh, various topics he would write to them about. So this one and a half years, he taught them. And obviously, he taught them the gospel. He taught them about Christ. He taught them about the Holy Spirit and the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And so that they would encounter and they would receive uh, for themselves uh, the baptism of the Spirit and the you know, the gifts of the Spirit, they would walk in it, right? And they started using it. And so we see the teaching and demonstration in the church at Corinth, and um, he spent a year and a half teaching them, right? That is what we see. Okay, uh, Acts chapter 21 and verse 21. Uh, 21 and 21 and also verse 28. It talks about uh, the accusation, actually, um, about about Paul. Um, so... Uh, 21, 21, uh, this is the disciples actually saying that, you know, these people have been informed about you, that you teach all the Jews uh, who are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses. So, you know, they, they knew that he was teaching something. He was, uh, you know, digging deep and, and giving them some revelation and some instructions to keep and so on. So that was, his, you know, the disciples are also actually testifying, you know, these people have been saying, talking this, that you teach them. Teach them not to keep certain things. Teach them not to, you know, obey uh, the law of Moses, and uh, that they should not be circumcised, and they don't have to be circumcised, and so on. Right? Um, verse twenty-eight also talks about uh, a similar thing, um, where they um, they accuse him, saying, "Men of Israel, help! This is the man who teaches all men." everywhere against the people, the law, and this place. So against the people, against the law, against this place. And furthermore, he also brought Greeks into the, brought Greeks into the temple and has defined this holy place. So, you know, we see that happening. Um, then we move on to the last uh, uh, one, which is Acts 28 and verse 31. So it talks about Paul and how he, uh, he was there um, in his own rented house. And uh, he was preaching the kingdom of God and teaching the things which concern the Lord Jesus with Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence. Okay, so, so the teaching ministry was something that was throughout his, uh, his journey, right, throughout his uh, ministry. So, um, so in the early church, we see that there, there was teaching uh, about the, the Lord Jesus as the Christ. And about some of the, you know, some of the practical things, how to walk, and uh, as we, how to walk as disciples of the Lord Jesus. And we, when we go through the epistles, we see detailed instructions, right? When we go through the epistles, we see the revelation and also uh, some of the practical, very practical things. So it's um, uh, not just revelation, which is um, uh, uh, disconnected from practical life. Right, uh, but very, very practical. This is how you live. This is how you overcome the flesh, and this is how you treat your children. This is how you treat your spouse, and and so on. Right. So we see this. Okay. So when it comes to certain instructions, right, for the uh, in the in the word about uh, this whole teaching ministry, uh, we see some instructions there, and uh, let's look at some of them. Okay. Okay. So. Uh, one is, uh, you see that there is, you know, just like how we see, we can have believers who are evangelizing, not really called to the ministry office, but believers who are evangelizing, you know, who, who share the gospel on a regular basis. Evangelizing believers, they are not whom you would call as evangelists, right? Uh, they may not walk in the office of the evangelist, but they are believers and uh, they evangelize they share the gospel right and every believer is called to share the gospel and similarly every believer has the opportunity and has the ability to teach right uh, to communicate whatever the lord has put in your heart you teach right so uh, romans 12 and verse 7 um, talks about in the body of christ 
in the body of Christ that there are you know believers and members who uh, carry out this particular task. So 12 and verse 7 talks about, you know, let's read verse 5. So we being many are one body in Christ and individually members of one another, having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. If prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith or ministry, let us use it in our ministering. He who teaches in teaching. So we see in the body of Christ, believers, members being placed and the gift of grace that is operating in them. And uh, it's talking about, you know, if it is teaching, then let them use it in their teaching. Okay. Um, Colossians 3.16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Let God's word dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. So he's talking about believers. He's writing to believers in Colossae and he's saying, you know, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. And out of that overflow, you will be able to teach and admonish and sing songs, uh, uh, hymns, spiritual songs with grace in your hearts to the Lord. So the word of God uh, really to be a rich deposit of God's word dwelling in one's heart. And uh, out of that, you teach as well. Right? Then we, of course, we read about the ministry gift of teaching. Okay? And the ministry gift of teaching, uh, you see in Ephesians 4.11, the some are called to be teachers okay so that is the uh, they go deep they get revelatory teaching and they ground people in the word of god and um, and god you know brings across certain moves and um, through them in the church right um, salvation by grace through faith the restorative moves you know you see that um, they were, and also about um, uh, about the work of the Holy Spirit and divine healing and all that we see that God uses this ministry gift uh, you know and restores um, these teachings back into the church so we see that happening and then even today right the ministry gift of the teacher um, we see that in 1 Corinthians 12 28 also okay um, an instruction that we see from the Lord Jesus is about with uh, related to teaching is that we are called to do and teach. Okay. So, which means that if I am instructing, first of all, this, whatever I have learned you know, applies to me. Okay. That's the thing. Whatever truth I see, you know, many times we hear and say, I don't know if you've done this, but uh, I've done this many times. I wish that person was there to hear this message. You know, I wish that relative hears this message. I wish that person was there to hear it. It applies to them. Right? They are the ones who are in this particular thing. I wish they hear it. But the fact is, since I am there, it applies to me. Right? So the truth, the whatever word is there preached or taught, since I'm there and I'm I'm listening, I'm the recipient of it, it applies to me. Let me never forget that. Right? And so um so the Lord is teaching in Matthew 5, uh, 19. It says, whoever therefore breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches men so shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. So the, the importance of doing or obeying, following and teaching. Right? Um, so that's the that's the order. So I learn something, the Lord teaches me something, the Lord puts in my heart something. It is for me to obey, it is for me to experience and do it and follow through with it. And then out of that it flows out to others. But the first of all, I need to do it. Okay, the one who does and teaches is called great in the kingdom of heaven. So that's the priority. That's the order. Okay, um, so it's not about discovering new things so that I can teach to the church, or you know, finding out, uh, getting a message so that I can teach on a Sunday morning, or uh, you know, it's it's never that, right? It's about uh, walking in the truth, 
that God has revealed that the Holy Spirit is quickened and out of the abundance, out of the overflow, teaching, admonishing one another, uh, just like we see in Colossians 3.16, right? Romans 2.12, 2.21, sorry. You therefore who teach another, do you not teach yourself? You know, is kind of reprimanding, right? You who preach that a man should not steal, do you steal? Like there's a rebuke there from Paul. So uh, the thing is for us to apply, for us to do it, and then teach it. Okay, that's the order. Um, the Lord Jesus also says this, Matthew 15 and verse 9, And in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrine the commandments of men. Okay, Matthew 15. Um, let's just look at that verse and the verses following that. Okay. Um, so he's actually talking about... Um, if you, if you look at verse 8, these people draw near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Okay, so he's describing, uh, they are saying the right things, uh, they seem to be doing uh, some things, but they are they honor me, they, they draw near to me with their mouth, they're saying all the right things, maybe they're singing all the right things, but their heart is far from me. Okay, their heart is not involved in it. Uh, they're not engaged in their heart. And, and then he goes on to say, and in vain they worship me. It's it's emptiness. Right? In vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. Okay? Teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. And, and he has some strong words to talk about them. And he says, calling them hypocrites. And he's saying, you know, well did Isaiah prophesy about you? And this is what Isaiah prophesied. And, and, and so... The, what is the Lord's admonition? You know, says that um, you do not teach, teach with the wisdom of the Spirit, right? Teach as led by the Spirit, but do not teach or lay unnecessary weights on people, commandments of men, and uh, as doctrine of God, right? There could be uh, certain traditions, maybe. There could be uh, certain things that are good things. Right, but these are not necessarily doctrines from the word. So know the difference, and and just say, okay, this is a suggestion, this is an opinion, right, and this is something that the Lord is putting forth. Right? And Paul, in in when you read through Corinthians, you'll see that he says, um, "Yet not I, but the Lord." Okay. And then he says, no, I do not have a commandment from the Lord, but I'm saying this as one who has experience and one who, to whom the Lord has you know, entrusted all this. So he's, he's actually making that differentiation, saying this is what the Lord commands, and this is, is what I'm sharing, but this, is, this comes from me with all these experience and as one who, to whom the, it has been entrusted, the gospel has been entrusted. So it comes with that weightage anyway. Okay. Uh, but the thing is, he made that differentiation. And so should we. Uh, we should abstain from teaching as doctrine the commandments of men. Okay, So what happens when we do that? We, we put unnecessary weights on people. right? We, put unnecessary, we make people jump through unnecessary hoops to get to you know, somewhere and say, okay, do, do this, 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 the five steps, six steps plan, etc. Uh, it has a you know, like a, um, a, a kind of an outer covering of knowledge and wisdom and good things, but it's really uh, a commandment of man, right? Unnecessary weights. So don't place it on people, right? Um, so, so that's what the Lord says. Okay, then go and teach all nations all things. So the scope of things, you know, in the in the Great Commission, uh, the scope of things is is really global. And uh, and the influence sphere of influence in which he, uh, God has placed you, and uh, that that sphere, uh, well, the, uh, according to God, it uh, you know it, he will expand it, he will increase it, and uh, it goes beyond uh, you know uh, the place that you are living and even. Um, so the 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 thing is that the scope is actually global. 
go and teach all nations and uh, and the word used there is ethne which uh, which in addition to people of different geographical nations like you know different continents and different countries and nations he's talking about people groups right uh, within your nation there could be people groups people groups with you know like they say india is a nation of nations like we have so many people groups so many languages so many diverse cultures and it's it's a wonder how can how we can be one country even you know like um so people groups is what he's talking about ethne uh, and go make disciples of all this so that's the scope of the call to to teach right um and that's the scope very very important we'll we'll stop with this the holy spirit is is our teacher right john 14 and verse 26 but the helper the holy spirit whom the father will send in my name he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that i said to you okay um so it's wonderful uh, that we have the ministry gift of the teacher okay who instituted that obviously the lord and he's placed that in the church placed that ministry gift in the church but we also acknowledge the fact that the holy spirit is the one who teaches he uses the words he uses the ministry of the of the the ministry gift of the teacher but the holy spirit is the one who you know actually teaches us convicts us and does something in our spirit right so so he sees we see that he is a teacher and in our personal times in our you know private moments he's teaching he's teaching us right so holy spirit, recognize invite the ministry of the teacher the holy spirit is our teacher the other thing that we see in 1 john chapter 2 and verse 27 is that the, the you know this, let me just read that but the anointing which you have received from him abides in you and you do not need that anyone teach you but the same anointing teaches you concerning all things and is true and is not a lie and just as it has taught you you will abide in him now you can use this verse and misapply this verse very easily and say uh, i have the holy spirit he's the teacher i don't need you to teach me like that would be misapplying it because when you look at the rest of scripture you see that we are members that you see that there's a ministry gift in the body and the context of 1 john 2 is is really about discernment discerning false teaching right discerning wrong doctrine and heresies okay, he's talking about false teachers many will come they will bring in destructive heresies um, well, John talks about that, right? So that is the context. So the anointing that you have received teaches you, the anointing of the Holy Spirit teaches you to discern, te teaches you to distinguish uh, what is false and what is not. You know, if you when you read through 1 John chapter 2, you'll, you'll understand the context, okay? So we'll stop here. And um, yeah, so we'll meet again uh, about uh, this topic on Monday, but otherwise we'll meet again on Wednesday, I guess. Okay, so you have a great day. God bless you. Uh, we'll meet again. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you, sir. Right. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.